let's start. Okay, so welcome everyone to the second seminar for this academic year organized by the Critical South Asia Group at the University of Warwick. Uh, before we begin, I would like to thank the Warwick uh, Interdisciplinary Center for International Development or WICKED uh, for support and especially to Maeve Moynihan for her technical support. Critical South Asia Group uh, also has a Facebook page where we announce our events. Please do follow us there and encourage others to do the same, to receive information about upcoming events and seminars. And we will also be posting a recording of today's seminar there, uh, as well as on Wicked's YouTube channel. Um, so please do like us and, and follow us there. We welcome your participation in today's event. So please post your questions in the Q&A channel of this Zoom event. Um, and if you want to ask your question um, orally, uh, please uh, raise your hand and our, our administrator will unmute you and then you can go ahead and ask your question. With that, I would like to welcome today's speaker, Professor Ajanta Subramanian, whose talk is entitled Meritocracy and Democracy, the Social Life of Caste in India. Ajanta is a professor of anthropology and South Asian studies at Harvard University. She has a wide range of research interests and her work focuses on areas such as political economy, political ecology, colonialism, post-colonialism, space and citizenship in the context of South Asia and the South Asian diaspora. Ajanta's first book, Shoreline's Space and Rights in South Asia, published by Stanford University Press in 2009, uh, chronicles the struggles uh, for resource rights by Catholic fishers on India's southwestern coast and focuses on how they came to constitute themselves as political subjects. Her latest book, The Cast of Merit, Engineering Education in India, published by Harvard University Press, Earlier this year, Ajanta? Or late last year? End of, yeah, end of 2019. Yeah, appeared late last year and is the subject of her talk today. The book has sparked some really interesting and important conversations on caste, and we are delighted that Ajanta is here to talk about it. Ajanta, it's fantastic to welcome an old friend and comrade uh, and a wonderful scholar to Warwick or rather virtual Warwick. I'm so glad you took time out uh, to join us. So welcome and um, yes, you, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, thank you Maeve and thank you Rashmi for organizing this and, and also for accommodating the date change. Um, in fact, two date changes because when I came to London I think it was in January of 2019. Um, I was hoping to actually come to Warwick in person and that didn't happen. And then, anyway, I'm very happy to be here um, and I'm really looking forward to uh, the Q&A after the talk. Um, so as Rashmi said, the title of the talk is Meritocracy and Democracy, the, the Social Life of Caste in India. Uh, in India today, the term merit is a ubiquitous one that generates a lot of political heat. Over the post-independence period, merit has come to reference forms of distinction that have a much longer social life. And while there are various social distinctions that are at stake in public debates around who does or does not have merit, the most politically charged point of reference is caste. The relationship between caste and merit is widely debated, but nowhere more vocally and consistently than in engineering education. Within the world of Indian engineering education, the institutions seen as most meritocratic are the IITs or the Indian Institutes of Technology, which are the focus of my research. A set of originally five institutions founded between 1951 and 61 and deemed institutions of national importance by the IIT Act in 1961, the IITs are directly administered and financed by the Indian central government and fall outside the structure of affiliation to universities which gives them far greater autonomy in institutional functioning, faculty hiring, and curricular development. 
their autonomy was guaranteed in other ways as well. In the name of ensuring merit as the only basis for admission, they were initially exempted from caste-based reservation policies. Soon after their founding, the IITs became stepping stones to transnational mobility, especially to the United States. From the 1970s, the professional and economic successes of IIT alumni in both India and the US generated a mad rush to gain admission to these institutions, pushing the number of candidates steadily upward and spawning a massive coaching industry to train students in exam preparation. Within Indian public discourse, the IITN has become an exemplar of intellectual merit, someone seen as naturally gifted in technical knowledge. What gets occluded in such assessments of the IITN's innate intelligence and competitiveness are the historical privileges that have enabled admission to the IITs. The majority of IITNs come from upper caste families of bureaucrats and academics, where capital has long been held in education. While arguably from middle class backgrounds, the value of their accumulated caste capital has spiked due to the reorganization of late 20th and early 21st century capitalism around the knowledge economy. At the same time, the role of caste and state in producing IITNs has been obscured in favor of their portrayal as uniquely meritorious individuals. The IIT story provokes some important questions. How does privilege become merit? How does the naturalization of the IITN's merit inform understandings of caste difference? And what does this mean for the possibilities and lim limits of democratic transformation in India? Before I turn to the research, let me say a little about my reasons for taking on this project. One of the main aims was to interrogate the widespread assumption that caste is a more salient basis of social distinction and self-definition for so-called lower than for so-called upper caste. More specifically, upper caste urban professionals are thought to have transcended caste to adopt more modern forms of identification. At the same time, professional classes and institutional spaces like the IITs continue to be majority upper caste in composition. Moreover, attempts at opening up these spaces to lower caste are consistently met with fervent opposition, not in the name of caste, but in the name of preserving merit. Despite continuing caste stratification and the claims to merit by upper caste, there's little scholarship that brings these issues together. This is where I see my work coming in. I look at the role of engineering education and the IITs in particular in producing claims to merit as expressions of upper casteness. To get at the relationship between caste and merit, I build on the work of sociologist Satish Deshpande on how upper castes are rendered casteless in India. The story of how upper castes transform their caste capital into modern capital is not well known, he says, because it runs with the grain of the dominant common sense. When it is seen and heard, it appears to be a story about something other than caste, like the story of nation building, for example. By contrast, the political use of caste by lower castes is a recurrent publicly debated theme. The result of this asymmetry Deshpande maintains is that the upper castes are naturalized as the casteless inheritors of modernity, while lower castes are hyper visible as the illegitimate purveyors of caste. For upper caste, he concludes, quote, caste qua caste has already yielded all that it can and represents a ladder that can now be safely kicked away having encashed its traditional caste capital and converted it into modern forms of capital like property, higher educational credentials and strongholds in lucrative professions, this section believes itself to be costless today." Unquote. My work builds on Desh Deshpande's but adds a key component. And this is the relationship between subaltern assertion and capital accumulation. That strategies of upper caste capital accumulation must be understood in relation to oppositional politics so that we can see how caste emerges out of longer historical dynamics and continues to be reconfigured in the context of democratic politics. But it's also to make the larger point that historical privilege does not simply reproduce itself. The proliferation of rights politics and the entry of new groups into spaces previously monopolized by upper caste have posed real challenges to caste hierarchies. The claim to merit is one strategy aimed at stabilizing the flux of political life in order to secure arenas of expertise and accumulation against lower caste advancement. However, even this claim to merit is not a guarantee 
and has to be continuously recalibrated in the face of new challenges. My work on the IITs tracks such changing expressions of upper costness. While I consider the IIT system as a whole, my main focus is on IIT Madras. Nadu is a particularly illuminating context in which to look at the relationship between lower cost assertion and upper cost capital accumulation because its history of cost politics has complicated the naturalization of merit and the transformation of upper cost into costless moderns. Here, as in other regions with histories of lower cost rights, merit is understood as a product of historical privilege and not simply of innate ability. In this sense, Thamarad calls into question Deshwani's account of castlessness as a stable structure of upper caste self-definition. Departing from his analysis, I ask how dynamics in Thamarad might inform an analysis of caste more broadly. When are claims to merit made on the base of basis of costlessness and when on the basis of caste? And how are status and stigma marked in the absence of explicit invocations of caste? Let me turn now to my research. I'll first give you a brief account of the role of caste in colonial technical education and then turn to IIT Madras and the making of upper casteness through claims to merit. For the post-independence period, I will look specifically at three phenomena, reservations, mass examinations, and diasporic mobility, and use each to show how the contours of upper casteness have shifted in response to new challenges. <clears throat> but first, let's go back to the 19th century. Caste played a critical role in the induction of Indians into formal technical training in the late colonial period. Through the 19th and early 20th centuries, racial barriers to technical education were expressed through a preference for engineers from England. It was only with the rise in nationalist criticism of colonial rule and the expansion of public works that the colonial government began to invest more systematically in formal technical training for Indians. The question of what kind of training this would be and who was best suited for it was hotly debated. From the beginning, we see tensions between two views of engineering. The first expressed an older orientation around engineering as practical learning unsuited to the classroom. The second newer view argued for the importance of engineering as formal conceptual education aligned with the social hierarchies of the colony. While this debate endured into the 20th century, the call to formalize engineering as classroom education ultimately won out. Although technical skill was more clearly evident among lower cost artisans and tradesmen, the emerging consensus over engineering as classroom learning and its connection to state power made literate upper caste the principal targets of this new knowledge. In elevating the classroom as the principal site of engineering knowledge, state planners marginalized those who had technique in favor of those schooled in write, reading and writing. <clears throat> in many ways, Madras presidency was an extreme case of the caste stratification of technical training. Here, the categories of Brahmin and non-Brahmin had become foundational units of administrative sociology through which technical training was implemented. <clears throat> through the 1910s, concerned with the erosion of so-called non-Brahmin occupations, in wood, metal, and textiles remained central to technical education policy. Such efforts distinguishing non-Brahmin from Brahmin pursuits strengthened and naturalized the link between cost and technical skill. The effects in the engineering field were clear as the numbers of Europeans in, Madras, in, in the Madras engineering services fell, Brahmins were the single largest group to fill the vacuum despite being barely 3% of the regional population. The correlation between caste and occupation and the overrepresentation of Brahmins in the modern professions became a rallying cry of the non-Brahmin and Dravidian movements, which profoundly shaped the Tamar political and social milieu. Within the technical sciences too, the impact of Dravidianism was far reaching. The Southeast was one of the first regions where caste quotas in technical education and employment were implemented. These measures had considerable success at changing the cost composition of engineering from the days when Thamar Brahmins filled over 70% of seats in regional engineering colleges. One of the lasting effects of Dravidianism has been a cleavage between Thamar Nath's other castes and Thamar Brahmins, with caste privilege more closely tied to Brahminness than in many other parts of India. In effect, Dravidianism interrupted the translation of caste capital into modern capital 
by making Brahmins hyper-visible as castes, a move that has been an important catalyst for a more far-reaching politics of meritocracy. An early instance of this uh, was the first post-independence legal challenge to caste quotas. In 1951, two Tamil Brahmin petitioners claimed that their fundamental right to equality and non-discrimination guaranteed by Article 51 of the Constitution was violated by regional quotas in medical and engineering colleges. The Madras High Court agreed. In a key passage, the judgment stated, and this is a long quote, it may be that through the fortuitous operation of a rule, which in itself is not discriminatory, a special advantage is enjoyed by some citizens belonging to a particular caste or community. This advantage is not taken away by Article 15.1. If students belonging to a certain community or caste, by reason of their caste discipline, habits and modes of life, satisfy the prescribed requirements in larger numbers than others, it is not permissible to shut them out on that score. It would be strange if, in this land of equality and liberty, a class of citizens should be constrained to wear the badge of inferiority because, forsooth, they have a greater aptitude for certain types of education than other classes." Unquote. The judgment redefined caste in two ways, from a system of graded inequality into community life, and from a form of historical advantage into collective aptitude. Moreover, it identified the quota itself as the source of discrimination. Deshpande argues that the 19, 1951 verdict offered upper caste a form of agency, quote, based on the universal normative position of costlessness and authored and disseminated a new kind of common sense where the very definition of caste was truncated and equated with the lower caste." unquote. Significantly, this common sense only deepened after the courts shifted in favor of quotas. Those who qualified for quotas were included in the reserved category on the basis of their caste affiliation, whereas those who did not qualify were simply classed under the general category of merit-based admissions. This absenting of caste from the general category has profoundly shaped the debate around educational equality in India. The distinction between the meritorious or costless on one side and the reserved or caste based on the other has allowed those who fall within the general category to argue that it is reservations and not historically derived inequality that undermines equal citizenship. However, there's another side to the 1951 judgment that also lives on. And this is the definition of caste as culture, as natural aptitude, and as the very basis of merit. The judgment set the stage for a politics of self-definition through which Thummer Brahmins equated caste belonging with having merit, which they argued was threatened by the very existence of the reserved category. With the expansion of lower caste rights politics across India, this claim to merit as the non-reserved has become a more generalized phenomenon seen not just in legal challenges to reservations, but in collective protests and in more everyday practices. In this sense, caste dynamics in Tamarnath set an important precedent for, for making the general category a putatively democratic norm whose external limit is lower costness. Let us now turn to the IITs to look more closely at how the Tamar Brahmin precedent set the stage for an expanding politics of meritocracy. As I noted earlier, three phenomena have been key to the making of upper costness at the IITs. The first is reservations. It was in the context of Tamar Brahmin legal challenges to quotas that IIT Madras was founded in 1959. As a central government institution exempt from regional caste quotas, it was quickly coveted by Tamar Brahmins as a meritocratic space shielded from lower caste claims where talent would find its due. This changed in 1973 when central government quotas for scheduled castes and scheduled tribes were extended to the IITs. Although there was opposition from all of the IITs, it was IIT Madras that led the charge in condemning the move as government overreach and a violation of meritocracy. Still, the extreme marginality and presumed intellectual inferiority of students admitted through the 1973 quota did little to destabilize an existing campus norm of IITians coming from upper caste families with shared histories of education and employment. Within Tamar Nadh, it is Brahmins who, is, who historically formed the core of this group. Unlike upper caste from other parts of India, Tamar Brahmins as targets of Dravidianism responded most defensively to the quota, 
by claiming IIT Madras as their own. But IIT Madras was not, was not simply a site for Brahmin caste kinship within a non-Brahmin region. Lower caste Tamars who gained admission through the general category were also assumed to be Brahmin. Gopi, a non-Brahmin alumnus, told me a story that captured this perfectly. He was changing his clothes when his Tamar Brahmin roommate inquired into the whereabouts of his punal, the sacred thread worn by male Brahmins. Quote, when I told him that I don't wear one, he paused and then asked, doesn't your mother get upset? It never struck him that, never struck him that I was backward caste. In fact, I think he still assumes that I'm from a particularly liberal Brahmin family, unquote. Gopi's experience speaks not to the costlessness of the IITN, but to the assumption that any Tamar who gets in on merit is by definition Brahmin. Other practices were also assumed to index caste difference. The display of bodily neglect was one. Ratty t-shirts, torn jeans, and chappals signaled a Brahmin background where the consumption of knowledge was prized over and above commodity consumption. By contrast, dressing well was, attrib was attributed to nouveau riche lower castes who didn't truly value knowledge. These assumptions acquired a disciplining force. Talani, a lower caste student from Chennai, told me how he made a point of switching out his shoes for chapels when he came back to campus after weekends at home. It was easier, he said, than standing out. Gopi's misrecognition as Brahmin and Karlini's attempts to fit in point to the assumed composition of the general category. While it purportedly marks a form of achievement available to all, assumptions about the caste bases of merit were ever present. Within IIT Madras, to be lower caste was to be non-meritorious. Moreover, non-Brahmin Tamars were forced to, to erase the complexity of their own history to, pro to produce flattened forms of caste difference that aligned with expectations of who did or didn't have merit. This desire to erase difference is particularly telling in the context of a region where a history of quotas has brought increasing numbers of lower castes into previously upper caste institutional spaces. Here, IIT Madras serviced the need to once again differentiate high from low. As status boundaries were blurring in the wider region, Within the walls of the institution, it was crucial to mark the general category Tamar as Brahmin. So how then did this regional dynamic set a precedent for a wider politics of meritocracy? In the 1990s, lower caste rights politics spread to other parts of India, resulting in the emergence of new constituencies and parties. One of the outcomes of this political ferment was the implementation in 1990 and 2006 of new central government quotas for other backward classes or OBCs that, when combined with the 1973 quota, expanded the reserve category to nearly half the student body of central government institutions like the IITs. As a result, what had been a regional dialectic of non-Brahmin claims to merit and Brahmin claims to, I mean, non-Brahmin claims to rights and Brahmin claims to merit expanded nationally. But now when such claims were articulated, they expressed not Brahminness but a consolidated form of upper casteness. The 1990 quota ignited a firestorm in North India with upper caste students engaging in street protests and masquerading as vendors, sweepers, and cobblers in a graphic depiction of their future reduction to lower caste labor. Echoing the 1951 judgment, the quota's detractors defined it as a violation of the ideal of equality and the reserved as, singular, as singularly undeserving. The 2006 quota further entrenched this opposition between general and reserve as widely shared categories through which the Indian public understood caste difference. In news articles, films, jokes, and online debates emerged an upside down world where stigmatization and exclusion were the plight of the general category and the reserved were illegitimate beneficiaries of state corruption. Unmistakable in such commentary was the outrage at the disruption of a natural order where upper caste dominance was assumed to be a byproduct of talent and desert. At the IITs, the expanded quota has produced a more explicit association between the general category and being upper caste. Moreover, private sector job recruiters have become vigilant about only hiring general category students. Several who got into IIT Madras through reservations recounted their chagrin at being pointedly asked for their JEE rank at the final stage of recruitment. 
Despite doing well up to that point, most didn't get the jobs. There's thus emerging a two-tier system of employment in which only general category students are seen as legitimate IITians. Still, this process of caste consolidation has not been smooth. The instability of upper caste identity becomes more evident when we consider the second phenomenon shaping dynamics at the IITs, which is the mass examination. The mass examination is commonly taken as an index of modern meritocracy. Unlike earlier processes of selection that explicitly favored a high-born elite, the mass examination was underwritten by an ideology of middle-class achievement where labor would find its just rewards. Its scale and finely calibrated set of ranked outcomes stood in for a process of objective evaluation beyond social and political influence. However, this assumption is belied by the structuring force of economic and social relations and the ideological power of cultural assumptions. As filtering mechanisms, mass examinations typically favor those who come from histories of education and have a facility with this technical instrument. A case in point is the IIT's joint entrance exam, which represents the fullest realization of India's examination fetish. It is widely perceived as a near perfect measure of merit because the pan-Indian scope of the exam is assumed to filter only the best out of a vast pool of applicants. However, it has not been a democratizing force. As noted earlier, the majority of IITians were children of upper caste civil servants. Their parents, themselves participants in another all India Ritual, which is the Union Public Service Commission exam, made a point of training their children to succeed in the intense competitiveness of examination culture. These structural continuities have made caste and class history key to exam success, even as perceptions of these exams as objective filters of individual ability have reinforced an ideology of meritocracy. In this instance as well, a more explicit claim to merit as a caste trait was first expressed by Tamil Brahmins. From the 1940s, Tamil Brahmins who felt shut out of regional education institutions and, and employment by the quota system invested heavily in exam preparation to enter central government schools, colleges, and bureaucracies, a phenomenon that one Tamil Brahmin IIT and referred to as a caste culture of coaching. With the opening of IIT Madras, this caste culture was directed towards a new goal. I heard many stories of mothers burning the midnight oil with their children, coaxing them to do practice tests so they could crack the JEE. There's a palpable sense within these accounts of both resentment and intellectual superiority, a combined claim to being a scapegoated and a uniquely deserving and talented caste. In the past 10 years, JEE co exam coaching has exploded into a billion dollar industry. The expansion of coaching has shifted the class profile of students at IIT Madras to include a large contingent from rural upper caste families in Andhra Pradesh and Telangana. Their arrival, however, has not been met with equanimity. In a newspaper interview about the proliferation of coaching classes, a former director of IIT Madras clarified that he was, quote, looking for students with raw intelligence and not those with a mind prepared by coaching class tutors, unquote. This notion of raw intelligence places the ideal IIT in outside institutional or even social formation as a naturally talented individual with a native capacity for technical knowledge. In conversations with him and other IIT administrators, I heard their concerns that the coaching industry undermined the ability of the exam to test for those who were truly worthy, in the process admitting students through the general category who were not actually gifted. It's clear that this divide between the gifted and the coached is not about act who actually attends coaching classes since virtually all IITians do. So who then are the coached? When pushed, I heard that they were from rural, non-professional and non-English speaking backgrounds. They were the ones who attended the so-called coaching factories where learning was rote and like the more boutique conceptual classes attended by the urban middle class. In some ways, it is these students who most destabilize the equation of merit with being upper caste. As noted earlier, the implementation of the, the various quotas has made it even easier to consign all lower caste students to the undeserving reserved category. But Telugu students are problematic, Telugu upper caste students are pro problematic because they are the wrong kind of upper caste. Their presence has led those 
from class histories of higher education and professional employment to, to distinguish themselves, not just from lower caste, but from non-ideal upper caste in order to claim merit as their exclusive property. That the claim to merit is in fact about property becomes clearer when we consider the final phenomenon, which is diasporic mobility. Caste inheritances have long been key, key to mobility. Here too, the Tamil Brahmin story prefigures a more widespread pattern. Over the 20th century and in the face of lower caste demands for the redistribution of power and resources, Tamil Brahmins have used mobility from countryside to city, from public to private sector, and from South India to the North and to other countries as a means to secure their economic and social standing. In Tamil Brahmin narratives, mobility comes across as an expression of cultural genius that across successive generations has allowed them to preserve merit against the odds. Their use of mobility anticipated similar trends across India. In the post-independence period, diasporic mobility emerged as a key tool for a wide spectrum of upper caste looking to secure the conditions for, for capital accumulation in the face of lower caste demands for access to public education and state employment. From the 1960s, the US emerged as the favored destination and quickly became the most affluent and highly educated node of the diaspora. Diasporic success has been hugely significant for reinforcing the link between meritocracy and caste. With the geographical distance from India and from challenges to caste entitlement, upper caste achievement abroad appears to be a form of self-made success. At the same time, the highly selective character of the US Indian diaspora makes easier a seamless equation between being upper caste being Indian and having merit. Within the US Indian diaspora, IIT alumni have been particularly active in shoring up their status as uniquely meritocratic individuals. After the IT boom of the 1990s, IITians in Silicon Valley began forging a new claim to merit as the basis of achievement. Now, however, it was a form of racial distinction through which they sought to make Indianness synonymous with technical talent and brand IIT a highly prized commodity. The early 2000s was a critical time for this project. Various magazines featured articles on the IITs. Forbes did a story titled Indians of Silicon Valley. Business Week came out with India's Genius Factories. And in a more sardonic vein, Scott Adams, creator of the comic strip Dilbert, debuted an IITian named Ashok. Most important was a 2003 episode of the new show 60 Minutes on the IITs, a carefully curated bit of publicity featuring choice quotes from prominent alumni that made the case for diasporic success as a natural extension of an IIT education. One of the highlights of the piece is an interview with Vinod Kosla, the co-founder of Sun Microsystems, who observes that Fortune 500 headhunters favor IITians over almost anybody else. As he put it, quote, if you're a wasp walking in for a job, you wouldn't have as much pre-assigned credibility as you do if you're an engineer from IIT, unquote. This project of self-racialization has been yoked to the cultivation of entrepreneurship. The Indus Entrepreneurs, an organization started by IIT alumni in Silicon Valley, boasts a membership of over 13,000 and its lists of mentors includes the most well-recognized Indian names in the corporate sector. In conversations with senior, senior mentors of the organization, I learned that the entrepreneurial ambitions of younger IITians are actively cultivated through the guarantee of seed funding. These expressions of transnational institutional kinship have both underwritten the commodity value of an IIT education and enhanced the racial mystique around the IITian's intellect. Together, such media events and institutional mechanisms have elevated the status of the IITs and their diasporic ambassadors but they've also produced new schisms between diasporic and homeland IITians. It's clear from speaking to Silicon Valley's IITians that they share a constraint, uh, they share an imagination of constraint and possibility. As do homeland alumni, they insist that in India, they were limited by a system that fostered mediocrity in the name of democracy and where the IITs were islands of meritocracy. But there's also something new in their embrace of entrepreneurial wealth accumulation as the basis of merit, IITians in Silicon Valley are increasingly at odds with an older upper caste orientation around higher education and lifelong professional employment. 
Although most are the children of civil servants and public sector engineers, they've gone from being beneficiaries of the developmental state to its most strident detractors. Significantly, their disdain for the Indian public sector now extends to homeland IITNs as well. As they see it, Indian conditions have forced IITNs who stayed behind to slip into mediocrity, with the result that only the diasporic IITN truly embodies merit. Many homeland, IIT, uh, many homeland alumni also endorse the diasporic branding project as good for the institution. As one put it, quote, the brand is a kind of ISO mark. You're assured of quality, like when you see a car made in Japan, it immediately sells, unquote. However, not everyone echoed these commitments to branding and entrepreneurship. When I asked one Homeland alumnus to compare alumni activity in the US and India, he responded without skipping a beat, quote, in USA, it's brand building. Here, it's nation building, unquote. As examples of nation builders, he offered a list of alumni, including an Ayurvedic doctor, a school principal, a minister of environment, and the head of an NGO working in primary education. Quote, these are all IITNs who have contributed to the development of the country, he said pointedly, but all you hear about now is Silicon Valley, unquote. Another alumnus who now teaches at IIT Madras confided that the entrepreneurship craze, as he called it, was demoralizing for faculty, whose students were far more interested in attracting the attention of venture capitalists than in learning the curriculum. Now, instead of engineering, he remarked in frustration, all they want to understand is the business of business. Particularly noteworthy was the stance of some Tamar Brahmin alumni who expressed a distaste for the blatant embrace of accumulation, which they felt was more aligned with a mercantile sensibility. To them, this was a disturbing departure from an older model of ascetic intellectualism that they claimed was a trademark characteristic of IIT Madras. One expressed his disquiet by saying, quote, all these good Brahminical values that, at least in the minds of some people in the South, used to mean that you should be good in academics and intellectual pursuits, that you shouldn't be taken in by all of these material things. All of this has vanished." Unquote. The invocation of bygone Brahminical values speaks volumes about the continuing transformation of upper casteness. As with the oppositions between the general and reserved and the gifted and coached, new tensions have arisen between intellectual and entrepreneurial conceptions of merit. The diasporic model of merit has not been embraced by all IITNs. To their surprise, those who were once emblematic of upper caste meritocracy now find themselves resisting its most recent iteration. So to conclude, in post-independence India, new patterns of caste stratification and, and consolidation have emerged through the very process of democratic change. Tamarnad is an important precedent for understanding this process. By throwing into relief caste privilege as the basis of achievement, Dravidianism forced Tamar Brahmins into a reactive claim to merit as an expression of caste culture. From the 1990s, this dynamic expanded nationally, making more explicit the equation between caste and merit and polarizing consolidated groupings of upper and lower caste. Exam coaching was one spanner in the works, that forced a redefinition of merit as, bo as both a caste and a class characteristic. And while diasporic mobility has allowed for more unfettered accumulation, homeland IITNs do contest the equation of merit with entrepreneurial success. So what does this process suggest for our understanding of Indian democracy? For one, the claim to merit as upper caste property calls into question the widespread assumption that only lower castes engage in identity politics. Rather, we must see the claim to merit as an expression of an upper caste identity politics. Second, the, shif the shifting meanings of upper casteness and the spaces of accumulation from land to central government employment, the domestic private sector, and the diaspora show the instability of privilege and the work it takes to maintain the upper hand against democratic challenges. The story of making merit at the IITs illuminates this broader relational dynamic as an integral part of the democratic process. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ajanta. I wish we could, uh, you could hear a loud applause that <laughs> you know, we would have given you. Um, I'd like to invite um, questions. You can put your questions through the Q&A channel or raise your hands and we will unmute you and you can ask um, your questions. Um, and I guess while people are 
thinking about uh, how to respond to this, you know, really fascinating uh, talk. And there's just so many thoughts, you know, that uh, the talk spurred in my mind. Um, and uh, I thought, you know, just to sort of ask, um, I guess, a more simple question, which is that, of course, the whole apparatus of engineering education in India um, you know, is, is so vast. And the IITs, in fact, are a small, a very small segment of that. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I just Googled there about 10, about 11,000 uh, engineering colleges in India with about 3.25 million uh, students studying in them. So I was wondering if during your research and you're thinking about, you know, the question of caste, if you also sort of took that into account and, and if the IITNs you, you know, you interviewed and you were talking to, uh, if they had a view on this proliferation of engineering education, which makes engineering no longer yeah. uh, a kind of an elite, you know, uh, stream of study, uh, you yeah. know, and, and it's just, yeah, there's a kind of democratization, I guess, at that level as well. Yes. So, yeah, 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 absolutely. I mean, you know, I, I think one of the one of the sort of trademark features of the post-colonial period in India was precisely the massive investment in technical education, right? Um, and and this this kind of idea of engineering in particular as the knowledge of the every man, right? <laughs> and increasingly of the every woman as well, right? Uh, there are many women who also ent enter the engineering stream. Um, so yes, uh, there's been a proliferation of engineering education and a, and a kind of democratization of access, but this democratization has not uh, has not been a, has not arrested the stratification of uh, of institutions, right? So the IITs are still very much seen as the top of the heap, right? Um, so there's this sense of a kind of uh, a, a highly stratified sort of tiered structure um, of engineering education um, with the IITs representing the most conceptual approach to engineering, right? So this notion of the IITs as providing a, a, a conceptual, a training in conceptual knowledge, which is distinguished from the more sort of practical approach, right, to engineering uh, that is more evident in sort of lower tier institutions has become a kind of another form of common sense, right? So just as in the, uh, in the colonial period, I sort of talked about how um, this distinction between the technical and the conceptual, right, uh, became the grounds for inducting principally upper costs into engineering, now that same distinction between the conceptual and the practical or the mechanical has become sort of a way of understanding a stratified structure of engineering education itself, right? Um, does that make sense? Oh, yeah. yeah, it does, it does. Yes, it's just endlessly fascinating. And uh, I feel lucky that I saw the first sort of- it Iterations uh, of this. Iterations of your research, yeah, some years ago. Okay, so there are lots of hands uh, which uh, have been raised. There are also questions in Q and A. Maybe we can alternate. Um, so um, I think Shambhavi Ganesh has her hand up. So I would invite her to ask her question um, and then take a question from Q and A. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, thank you, Professor Subramanian for the amazing um, talk. And um, um, uh, my question was about, um, uh, you know, engineering colleges have uh, mostly uh, boys and men uh, sort of occupying um, them, the space. I was wondering about, uh, uh, you know, the masculinity uh, and if you um, had any, um, uh, you know, opinion to offer on how gender was performed, uh, especially in the kind of upper caste uh, uh, culture that uh, you had observed and talked about. And my yeah. second question was also the right and wrong kind of uh, upper caste that you had talked about, like yeah. you know the Brahmin upper caste from Telugu, the the Telugu speaking areas who were coming. I was wondering if maybe the women, uh, if, if they ever made it to the, the IITs, uh, who were how were they conceptualized and thought of? Yeah. Were they thought of as the right kind of uh, you know merit holders or not? 
Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so, I mean, it's true that the IITs are overwhelmingly male in composition, right? Uh, it, in none of the IITs has has the percentage of women students at the at the B Tech level, um, I think ever exceeded ten percent. So it is an overwhelmingly male student body. This is not the case uh, when it comes to regional engineering colleges, right? So you know IIT Madras is literally across the street from Anna University, right? Which is the kind of considered the next tier of engineering institution um, uh, in Tamil Nadu, and if you look at the uh, the BTEC student body in Anna University, there are huge numbers of women, right? And women constitute uh, upwards of 40% of the student body. So uh, so women do en en enter engineering, um, but as you sort of head up uh, the tiers of institutions, um, they do become more and more male, right? So the IITs are the most male of engineering colleges. Um, so. Yes, I mean, I was I, part of what was so interesting to me was the performance of a kind of upper caste masculinity, um, which is which is sort of pitted not so much against women but against lower caste men, right? So there's a there's a sort of there's a performance of a kind of caste specific masculinity, which I sort of gestured to when I when I talked about this um, needing to dress down, right? Um, and 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 not um, not act like you care about commodity consumption, right? So this is one way in which a kind of upper caste masculinity becomes performed as you know upper caste men as sort of walking brains, right? That they they have sort of this open and flagrant disregard for their bodies, right? So this is one way in which uh, masculinity gets performed, and I could sort of give you many more examples, but let me just stop there when it comes to masculinity. I mean, it's so interesting because I did interview a number of women um, and I found that women for the most part subscribe to the same cost sensibility as their male counterparts, right? So um, they also felt that, you know, that cost was the main cleavage when it came to the determination of merit. It wasn't gender, it was cost. And when I asked upper cost male students why there were so few women, um, um, at, uh, on their campuses, they would typically talk about societal constraints, right? Like, oh, you know, Indian families are conservative and they don't want their girls to go into engineering, et cetera. In other words, they would, they would give me structural explanations, right? Social structural explanations for the, the low numbers of women. Whereas when it came to the low numbers of lower costs, they would point to intellectual ability, right? Uh, so there was this real distinction between how women were talked about and how lower costs were talked about. Um, and so for me, it became clear that at least when it comes to the determination of merit, cost is a much more important and salient, base, salient basis of distinction than gender. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Ajanta. And I think that answers someone, another, I think it was Sharanya who'd asked the question about uh, if you could address the intersectionality of caste and gender, which I think you just have. Um, so uh, we can probably have, uh, is it Suranya Srivastava who has her hand up? Yes, hi. Um, so, I had two questions. One was about the gender lens, which I think has been sufficiently answered. Thank you for the um, really great and informative lecture. Uh, my second question was on the, it's a bit more conceptual and based on definitions, but was on the use of the word um, castlessness, which was based off of Satish Deshpande's work. work. Uh, yeah. I was wondering what you would like how you would compare it to the concept of caste blindness, which has also been used, I think, sometimes in comparison to race blindness that happens between, like, say, white Americans versus people of color. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I think they're very similar. Um, I mean, I think they sort of operate in a very similar way. 
Um, let me think about whether I see any differences between them. Um, I mean, both are uh, both are a claim to. So I would say once one maybe sort of slight distinction between them is um, is that caste blindness or race blindness um, is about you know is a, is is an argument about not seeing uh, these kind of mechanisms of social difference, right? N not seeing or not not being able to recognize social difference, right? So that's the sort of argument behind cost blindness or race blindness. I think the costlessness claim is more about self-definition, right? It's about upper caste in particular having transcended cost belonging and cost identification, um, and and which is not the case when it comes to lower cost, right? So costlessness is actually a, a an argument about distinction, you know, about upper cost being distinct from lower cost because unlike lower cost, who are caught up in these forms of cost uh, self definition, upper cost have moved beyond that, right? To a form of kind of modern identity, which is um, characterized by a transcendence of cost. Does that make sense? I think one is an argument about, so the blindness argument is more about the not seeing co cost or race as operative at all in society. Whereas costlessness is more about upper cost themselves having transcended cost. Um, and therefore being able to claim a kind of modern subjectivity that is denied to lower costs. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it does. Thank you for that. Yeah, part. yeah. Yeah, thank you. Okay, I'll pick up a question from Q&A now, and this is from Shoma Biswas. Uh, I guess this is a comment and perhaps also an invitation to reflect on this. Uh, Shomak writes, absolutely fascinating, Ajanta. Might I connect this to Ross Bazet's work on technology education in India and its links with the US? Both yeah. your works seem to emphasize the specialness of the US as an increasingly important site to mobilize and settle a new mm -hmm. meritocracy based on upper caste Indian migration. So if you want to comment to just, on that. And... Yeah, I mean, I, I found um, the tech, the name of the book is The Technological Indian to be um, sort of hugely important. Um, um, he doesn't deal so much with the cost question. Um, you know, his book is more about uh, uh, um, uh, the, the, the sort of increasing equation between um, uh, technical skill and knowledge and um, and Indianness, right? And, and how this equation has facilitated um, the the you know both the kind of transnational mobility of increasing numbers of Indians um, to the United States um, and their role within the academic and technology sectors in the U.S., right? So. Cost. I mean, he deals with a little bit, but not not really, not not very much, right? Um, um, but yes, I mean, I, I see the U.S. as a really important site for thinking about the transnationality of cost, right? So thinking of cost as very much a transnational formation, uh, where you know. Uh, which, which requires us to connect um, dynamics in India to dynamics in the diaspora, right? Um, um, so for me, you know, this is an argument for um, getting past a kind of methodological nationalism when it comes to the treatment of caste, right? Um, and understand, in order to understand 
how cost moves, how cost travels, and what happens to it um, in the process, right? How it gets sort of reconstituted um, in new ways, um, in new contexts. Um, and in the context of the US, I think it's, it's, it's been really important for me to think about race, cost, and class together to understand how that, that form of inter intersectionality operates. Um, so, and you know, Ross Bassett does this in his work as well. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's important that Indian Americans and you know, Indian Amer Americans of the professional class in the US um, are both, a race, are, are both, both occupy a kind of elite class status and our racial minorities. So how does this sort of, how do these two things come together, right? Um, and, um, and then, and, and how do we then add, add cost to that, to that equation? Um, and for me, you know, unlike other, it's, so it's not just important to think about how cost travels, but to see how cost is operative in the US, which is, the most affluent and well-educated node of the Indian diaspora, right? Um, I mean, it is an over, the Indian American population is overwhelmingly upper caste in composition, right? So that itself matters when you compare not just the US to India, but the US to, to Britain or to Fiji or to Trinidad, you know, other sites of diasporic mobility. Um, so the specificity of the US is important um, and thinking about the transnationality of cost, I think, is also really important. And both of these things, I mean, I've built on ba Ross Bassett's work to think about both of these things. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ajanta. Actually, I had another question for you, which is about the concept of merit. Yeah. Um, I think that, you know, it was fascinating. You, you did trace it from the 19th century, you know, onwards, what, uh, you know, what a good education for the Brahmin was like and how the Brahmin was equipped for, you know, classroom instruction and, and how, you know, this sort of uh, reinforced class distinctions and so on. But uh, have you seen in more recent times any shift in the idea of, of uh, merit itself in terms of how the, the lower castes so the more deprived castes are thinking about merit now? I mean, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, this is a question that has been put to me um, by, especially by Dalit IITians, right? Yeah. Who argue that, you know, my, my efforts to, um, to kind of narrate merit as, uh, as an upper caste claim um, obscures their own claim to merit, right? Um, and, and, and what do I do with that? Uh, uh, is there a way that I'm sort of disregarding um, merit itself as, as contested terrain, right? Um, and I, and I, and I, I think that that's a really important point. Um, and I'm not saying that the meaning of merit has been fixed once and for all, um, but, but for me, the, I think that this is a, this is a really, it, it, it's a really difficult set of meanings to contest, you know? Um, um, and, and it, I think also because I mean this student who made national news, right? Who's from yes. from his background who yeah. topped the the ex entrance exam yeah. recently. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, exactly. And but but I think it's a really it's a really difficult um, mm -hmm. the politics of merit is so arrayed against <laughs> against you know. Uh, both lower cost claims, but also against other conceptions of value, you know? I mean, one of the things that, that this sort of, uh, this, this, this need to fight on that, on those grounds and to, um, 
and to use these terms of contestation, to use merit as this sort of principal ground of contestation. I mean, what it does is it sort of reinforces an existing hierarchy of value where, yeah. you know, only professional education uh, is seen as important. Um, you know, only engineering um, is seen as having the kind of value that people should aspire to. I mean, Tamil Nadu is a perfect example of the limits, right, of this claim to merit on the part of lower costs. I mean, Tamil Nadu is, a, is a, you know, it's it's a place, it's a it's a it's a context where, you know, huge numbers of lower costs have entered uh, the professions, right? Uh, I mean, this has been one of the kind of uh, obvious uh, outcomes of Dravidianism, right? Um, the professional class in Tamil Nadu is much more varied than in other parts of India. Um, but what has been kept in place is precisely that hierarchy of value where, you know, where the professions are still seen as far superior, right, to, to you know, humanities not just, humanities work or you know, humanities, yeah. the arts, but not just, I'm not talking just about education, but yeah. to other, yeah. to other forms of manual labor, um, you know, so that hierarchy of labor and that hierarchy of value, I think is kept in place uh, when lower costs are principally engaged with claiming to, in making their own claims to merit and especially claims to merit via engineering and the professions, you know? Mm -hmm. so I think there's a kind of, there are limits to that kind of politics. Um, yeah. yeah, I think that is very well said. Um, I know that there are other questions, but I also am taking a look at uh, the time. We had promised ourselves and everyone else in this era of being zoomed out that we would keep our sessions to an hour. Um, so I think that perhaps this is a good place to, uh, to conclude um, our session. And I'm sorry for, to those of you who couldn't uh, get a chance to ask your questions. I'm sure Ajanta will be happy to connect with you on email. Um, so do, you know, do ask yeah, your definitely. questions. Yeah, through that. But Ajanta, once again, thank you so much. This was absolutely fascinating, interesting, and yeah, amazing. I'm running out of adjectives. <laughs> <laughs> but it, yeah, it was wonderful to have you. And uh, thank you to everyone for uh, joining us today. Um, this is the last seminar of this term, but we will be back with more next term. So stay tuned um, and thank you.